Hi, well, today we're going to be turning to the life of Jacob, the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham. And he's the last of what we call the patriarchs or the fathers of the soon-to-be nation of Israel. Interestingly, God aligned himself with these three in a very particular way. He called himself the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. But after this, he aligned himself with the people, the descendants of these three, the people of Israel. And Israel was the name of a person. In fact, the very person we're considering today, that was the name given to Jacob. Now, his mother was Rebecca, and he was the second born twin. His older brother, just by a few minutes, was Esau. His father was Isaac, and he was 40 years old when he married Rebecca. And Rebecca failed to conceive children for a further 20 years. And so we're told that Isaac pleaded with God for her. And God heard his cry and she conceived the twins. But she could feel them really struggling and fighting within her. And she asked the question, if all is well, then why do I feel like this? Or why am I like this? Contending with all this struggling inside of her. And she did the right thing. She inquired of the Lord and God told her, he said, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. Well, as Esau was born, the still unborn Jacob was seen grasping at his brother's heel. Hence the name Yaakov or Jacob, which means heel grabber. Well, the family that Jacob was born into moved around a bit. They first lived in the south near Beer Lachairoi, which is just here in the Negev Desert, not far from a place called Kadesh Barnea. Later, because of a drought, they moved here to Gerar. It was a Philistine town where Isaac did very well for himself. And from there, they settled in Beersheba, just here on the map. Today, it's a vibrant Israeli city. Well, the two boys grew up, Esau became a skilled hunter and an outdoor man. We're told that Jacob was a mild man, a shepherd who tended to stay closer to home. We're also told that Isaac favoured the company of Esau, whilst Rebekah favoured the company of Jacob. Now, one day, returning exhausted from a hunt, Esau pleaded with Jacob for some food. He was nearly fainting with hunger, thirst and exhaustion. And the Hebrew word weary here means far more than just a little tired. However, Esau was rash and he agreed to sell his birthright or his inheritance for the food and for the drink. Now, an early form of primogeniture existed in these times and that's where the older son inherited from his father. And this is what Esau sold. It was to cause great strife between the two brothers, as you can imagine. Now Jacob, with the help of his mother, would even deceive his own blind father to receive this inheritance. I wonder whether, having been told that her older would serve the younger, she was trying to speed things along. We don't know. We're told that Esau despised Jacob from that very day and he swore to kill his brother. On hearing about this threat, Rebekah warned Jacob, your brother will surely kill you, so flee to my brother, Laban. Now Laban uh, lived in a place called Haran. It was miles away, right up north between the two great rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris. Interestingly, from Ur of the Chaldees, Abraham and Sarah came and lived in Haran for many, many years. In fact, Abraham left his father here to come to the Promised Land. It was a long 450-mile journey and would have taken some time. Jacob was to stay there until Esau's anger had cooled down. And even Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him on his way with instructions to find a wife amongst Laban's family. He did not want his son to marry a Canaanite girl. Now Esau heard about this and to spite his father, he did just that. 
he went to Abraham's oldest son, Ishmael, and took one of his daughters to be his wife. Now, whilst en route to Haran, Jacob spent the night at a spot that we would later call Bethel. God gave him a dream and he saw angels ascending and descending on a ladder from heaven. And above this ladder stood God himself. And he reiterated the promise that he'd made to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. He said, I am Yahweh, the God of Abraham and your father, the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and I'll keep you wherever you go and I'll bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I've spoken to you. Well, what a reminder that God is faithful to his word for generation after generation. He eventually outworks his plans and he so often does it despite the failings of men and women. And the more you read scriptures, the more you realise how God uses people who have failed in so many ways. He just requires that we have faith in him and that we are being changed. He doesn't require perfection but he does ask us to change over time. Now, as a result of this experience, Jacob named the spot the house of God or Beth-el, Beth-el. Well, getting to Laban would have taken a month or more, up through Canaan, picking up on the way of the sea, that ancient road for a short while, and then picking up the King's Highway all the way up to Damascus and then Tadmor and Rezef and finally reaching the lands of his mother's family. As he approached he came to a well and he asked a group there where they were from. We're from Haran, they answered. Well do you know Laban, he asked them. And they replied, yes, and indeed, here comes Laban's daughter with a herd to water at the well. Her name is Rahal or Rachel. She was a shepherdess. And he told her who he was, and she ran back to tell her father, and they were delighted to meet him, and he stayed in their house for a month. Now Laban had two daughters. Leah was the older. She was delicate and plain, we're told. Rachel was the younger, who we're told was beautiful in both form and appearance. And Jacob fell in love with Rachel, and he agreed to work for Laban for seven years as payment for his daughter. It says that he loved her so much that the seven years felt like just a few days to him. And after seven years, Jacob asked Laban to fulfil his side of the bargain. Well, the marriage was organised. The marriage was behind a veil. And it was not until the following morning that Jacob realised what had happened. I don't know whether it was too much drink or too impressive a veil or not enough light. I don't know what it was, but Jacob was shocked when he realised who he'd married. It says, and behold, it was Leah. That's all the Bible tells us. Well, a dirty trick had been played by Laban, who feared that his oldest daughter might never get married if it were not by subterfuge. Now, all of this predated God's commands to Israel and to Israel's kings that marriage should be to one wife and one wife only. And in Jacob's day, polygamy was still seen to be acceptable. This does not apply today, of course. Jacob was now forced to work for yet another seven years in order to marry Rachel. And 14 years later, it happened. He was a patient man. The two indeed were married. Jacob, Leah and Rachel were to stay in Haran for many more years. Leah fell pregnant many times, six times. Rachel found that she could not conceive and so used her maid as a surrogate. And that maid bore two sons. As we said, Leah bore six sons, but she also used her maid as surrogate to bear two more. Now, Rachel did go on to have two of her own sons, Joseph and Benjamin. And so the fathers of the future 12 tribes of Israel were born 
to these four women? Well, it says, it says that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, and as a result, he loved her two sons more than the others. And this favoritism would later be the cause of much family trouble. Now, during this time, God blessed and increased the wealth of Laban because of the presence of Jacob. And Laban understood this to be the case. And it was after the second youngest son, Joseph, had been born that Jacob begged leave to take his family and his belongings and return to his own country. Well, what can I give you as repayment for all that you've done, Laban asked Jacob. And Jacob simply said, let me take the worst of your flocks, those that are marked and speckled and spotted. And Laban agreed, and so it was. The only problem was that God now ensured that an unusual number of goats and sheep were born spotted and speckled. And Jacob's flock became very large. And this angered Laban. And Jacob became greatly concerned about this anger. And it was now that God said to Jacob, leave, go back to your land and I will be with you. Well, after three days, Laban heard that Jacob had fled and he pursued Jacob. In fact, he pursued him all the way to the mountains of Gilead in Canaan. He intended him harm, but the night before they caught up with Jacob's family, God spoke to Laban and he warned him not to speak good nor bad about Jacob, not to trouble him. And the two sides made a covenant in the mountains of Gilead and they parted together in peace. While well, Jacob continued south, we're told that the angels of God were camped near by and they met with him. You see, he'd yet to meet his brother Esau after so many years. And with no idea what reception he was going to get, he needed all the support that could be mustered. And after meeting with the angels, Jacob sent messengers to his brother who was now in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom. Indeed, Esau became the father of the Edomites. They lived here in modern day Petra, carved out of a rock. This incredible city, amazing, highly defendable city, carved out of rocks, a bastion in modern day Jordan. Later, they would be known as the Edomians and would come to inhabit areas in the south of Israel right here. One famous Edomian or Edomite was King Herod. And how amazing Jesus from the line of Jacob would stand before and be confronted by Herod from the line of Esau. And a great bitterness would trouble these two peoples down the ages. The messengers returned and replied to Jacob that Esau is coming to meet with you and he's coming with 400 men. Well, Jacob was greatly fearful about this. Oh God, he cried, God of Abraham and my father Isaac, deliver me from this trouble. Jacob sent gifts, droves of goats, sheep, camels, colts and cows were sent ahead of him with a message uh, that these are from your brother Jacob who awaits to meet you. That night, Jacob took his wives and their two handmaids and his 11 sons, Benjamin was not yet born, and he took them and crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. Now that's right here between the towns of Penuel and Machanaim in modern day Jordan. This is a picture of that river and quite likely the crossing place of the ford that they used. Now, whilst he was alone at this place later that evening, he wrestled all night with a stranger, a man. In the book of Hosea, we're given a bit of an insight. It says that the Lord will punish Jacob according to his ways and requite him according to his deeds. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel and in his manhood, he strove with God and he strove with the angel and he prevailed. He wept and he sought his favour. Now we don't know who this strange character was. The passage calls him a man and for that reason some people believe that it was Jesus, the member of the Godhead, who would one day become a man. Others say it was an angel because of the passage in Hosea. Well we don't know for sure. 
We do know that they struggled all night and that eventually the man overcame Jacob by touching his hip and putting it out of joint. Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the stranger said, what is your name? Jacob, he replied. Well, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And the man said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him right there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life has been preserved. An interesting portion of scripture. Well, the following morning, he saw his brother Esau coming over the hill with his 400 men. He lined his family up and then he crossed over the water ahead of them and he bowed down seven times to his brother. And we're told that Esau ran to Jacob and he fell upon his neck, kissing him in tears. It was an amazing and gracious reunion before between the two brothers while they eventually went their separate ways in peace God worked among Jacob's people wherever they went and the Canaanites came to have a healthy fear of the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob because of his deeds the family settled in Bethel and whilst there God appeared to Jacob and reminded him your name is Jacob but you shall be no more known by that name you shall be known as Israel, God prevails. He said, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I give to you and to your descendants after you. I give them this land. He says, then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And so Jacob set up a pillar in that place where God had talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel, the house of God. It was not long after this that they were on a journey, and Rachel was heavily pregnant. They'd reached Ephrath later known as Bethlehem. And she went into hard labour on the side of the road and she died there, giving birth to Benjamin. She was buried in Bethlehem, the birthplace of the future Messiah, her future, many times, great-grandson. Soon, too, Jacob's father Isaac died and both Jacob and Esau buried their father together. Well, the next we hear of Jacob is through the story of Joseph and the great famine that drove the sons to Egypt. We can't go into that now, but you can click up here for that story and the amazing picture of the Messiah that Joseph gave us. After so many years, Joseph would eventually meet his dad Jacob again when he was brought to the land of Goshen in Egypt. And Jacob made Joseph a vow that when he died, he would not be buried in Egypt, but we would be taken and buried with his fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. He was sick by now and he was soon to die at the age of 147. We're told that his sons carried him to the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre which Abraham brought with the field from Ephron the Hittite as a property for a burial place. And we're told that their mourning was so great that it caught the attention of the surrounding Canaanites who remarked on how deeply these people mourned for their beloved father. I think that one of the biggest lessons that we learn from this story is that God is a covenant-keeping God down the generations. Did you know that a covenant is more than a promise? It's far more than a contract. If one side breaks a contract, then the other side is free. But that was never, ever the case with a covenant. 
And God would later say to Israel, you've broken your covenant with me, but I will never break it with you. It's a lifelong total commitment as demonstrated so incredibly by the prophet Hosea in his tragic life. And again, you can listen to that up here. God never breaks a covenant and he expects the same from us. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't break covenants. And it does not mean that God won't forgive such a break. But God does take it very seriously. Never more so than when it comes to marriage for better or for worse. For richer or for poorer in sickness or in health, we commit no matter what comes our way, just like dear old Hosea. And this covenant-keeping God is the sort of God that we worship, and that means he will never let go of those who continue to put their faith in Jesus and the covenant represented through the blood of Jesus. And that's the sort of faithfulness that makes our God such an utterly amazing God. God bless you.